Hey dudes, Jason here. Uh, just going to hit you with that uh, ball and tail tutorial that I promised. Um, so you can use this for your homework, right? So by all means, please do. And I'd also recommend then using this to practice for your test. All right, so let's jump into it. So we're inside After Effects. We're going to make all of our assets inside of After Effects so that the bend it expression or uh, effect rather doesn't uh, break anything. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is uh, I am going to bring up my rulers. All right, uh, show guides and view will have show rulers. And I'm just going to place an object for the floor or a ruler for the floor rather. I will lock that guide and now I can't change it. All right, the next thing I'll do is I'm going to make a circle for the head. All right, so make a perfect circle holding down shift. Okay, deselect my shape, reselect my shape. Let's give it a fill. We can take the stroke away. Uh, and we'll grab my pan behind tool to move my anchor point to the bottom center. All right, that's where our squash and stretch is going to take place. Okay, now uh, in order to make this work, we also need a null object, right? So we're going to go layer, new, null object. That makes our little red square over here. Uh, I'm just going to zoom in and I'm going to position this in the sort of direct center of that. Grab my uh, pan behind tool and center that anchor point. All right, so that way, if I do anything, all right, um, shit, train of thought, phone calls. Uh, okay, so we're going to center our um, null object into the center of our ball, so that if we need to do any rotation, uh, we can then also just do it on that object there. All right, so I'm going to rename this null to controller. Please make sure to do that. All right, I'm a stickler for neat layers. Uh, I've let you guys get away with it for now, but please make sure to label your uh, your layers correctly. All right, so we've got the null and we've got the ball. And we're going to start off by um, animating this ball completely first. All right, and then we'll jump into the tail. So super fast because we're all familiar with the uh, bouncing ball at this point. I'm going to parent my ball to my controller. So I can do that with this little pick whip tool, uh, drop it over there, or I can just select controller there. Uh, and then I can lock it because I'm not going to be using it for now. Grab my position, we'll start my ball off sort of over here. Uh, and because I've parented it to this null object, I can actually scale it down without uh, affecting the scale of my ball layer. Um, so we can make it a little bit more manageable. All right, so I wanna introduce some anticipation to, uh, to this. So I'll start off with my ball sort of in the, uh, the third, right, the first third of the screen. And then I'm gonna drag myself out uh, a couple of frames, doesn't matter how much just yet, we can always change it later. And I'm gonna drag my, my ball backwards, all right? And this is going to be the, the ball sort of getting ready to, to leap, all right? Uh, so then I can uh, copy paste that keyframe, Control or Command C and V, all right? So just so that there's no movement in between, um, I'll apply easing to my work now, just by hitting F9, uh, so that I can um, see what's happening uh, at, at sort of like real time. All right, so my ball has now waited and it's done its squash and stretch and it's gonna jump. So I'll grab that controller, um, just sort of move it up a little bit so I don't accidentally select one of the other key points, jump him into the air and land him down again. All right, and I'm sort of just placing my keyframes on these uh, seconds for now, just because it makes sort of navigating this so much easier. Um, let's just have that go up there and we'll have that go up there um, and up here. All right, so you'll see now that uh, because I was adjusting my keyframes, I've got this horrible loop going on here. And that's just because there is a path uh, set on this animation path, right? So there's like one of those loops set on it. So I'm just gonna grab my pan, uh, my uh, convert vertex tool and I'm gonna click these points over here and that will remove that like so, all right. 
Uh, and then I can just also grab that keyframe and shift it up to where it needs to be. All right. Uh, so there we go. So we've got our anticipation. We're now going to introduce some arcs uh, to this uh, sort of uh, this jump that's about to happen. So pulls back, jumps into midair, lands, and then I'll just pull myself out a couple of keyframes. Uh, and then again, just making sure to get rid of that path over there. I will bounce my ball up, uh, move down the timeline again. I'll bring it back down to where it hits the ground. And then again, down the timeline, take it up, but not as high. And then down the timeline again, and it will come to rest at this point. Alrighty. So the next thing we can do, obviously, is to jump into the graph editor. So I'll grab one of my keyframes, jump in here. You guys are hopefully familiar with this by now. Uh, and I'm just going to throw some random graphs in here. All right, so that's going to go ease into that. Uh, we know that when a ball jumps, when it's in midair, that's its slowest point. So we're going to create our peaks. Uh, I can zoom in here and I can drag this off of that horizon line. Alrighty. Uh, and then it's going to land quite quickly. So I can really make that peak quite intense. Um, and then we just need to react to that, right? So it's hitting the, the ground with a lot of speed. So it will then leave the ground again with a lot of speed. Uh, it will hang in midair. So I can push that away there, lift these slightly off of that horizon line so it doesn't hug fast. Um, cool. Again, it's going to hit the ground with a fair amount of force, hang in the air, and then eventually gravity will take over and force it back to the ground. All right, so if I play through this, cool. Boom, 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 great. I'm happy with that so far. So we'll save it just so that if something happens, I don't lose it all. Um, okay, so we're done with that. The next thing we can do is we can adjust our squash and stretch on our ball. All right, so I'm gonna lock my controller. I don't want to mess up anything for that. Um, although I can leave it showing just the position so that I can use these as guides. All right, and we'll make a scale key. Remember to unlink my scale parameters. All right, we'll add easing by hitting F9. Uh, and then as our ball sucks back, all right, I want it to uh, suck in on itself, uh, or like stretch rather. So we'll make that 8120, so it gets nice and tall. All right, so sucks in on itself. Uh, it can hold for that. So I'll copy paste that keyframe. Uh, just scrub back and forth to make sure sometimes when you have a copy pasted easing frame there's like this weird little bit of interpolation in between which means that there's a little bit of movement so sometimes we just need to get rid of that but this is looking pretty good um, and then obviously my ball can't really jump from this angle right uh, or from this sort of size it, it doesn't have that sort of squash that would allow it to propel itself so I think like two frames, maybe three frames before I actually get to the point where it starts jumping. Uh, I'm just going to then swap these values around. Um, so it looks as though it's, it's pulled itself back. Right? So imagine like a, um, a baseball player sort of winding up for that throw, pulls back and then just before it jumps, boom, sucks itself down. And then because I'm lazy, I already have this keyframe at 8120 where it's nice and stretched. I can just copy that and it will do that for me. All right, boom. I could drag this out a little bit further. We don't necessarily want it to stretch too far too soon. Here we want a perfect circle. Again, I can copy paste my initial keyframe because that was a perfect circle. Uh, before it hits the ground, again, I can copy paste that stretched keyframe. All right. Uh, we hit the ground, we get nice and squashed. So I can copy paste that keyframe. And then as this ball is jumping into midair, uh, again, I'll start um, stretching it. So to give myself some ideas, I'll just copy that keyframe again. Uh, but I'm going to now diminish the difference between the two, right? Because we've lost that energy. Okay, so boom. I'm not really going to bring it back to a perfect circle here. It's going to make it look really squishy if I do. So instead, I'm just going to leave it stretched. Um, 
and then I'll squash it back down again when it hits the ground and we'll just adjust the graph editor which will allow that to to look better all right so I think what we can do then is we can just align that like so so it's in the air it hits the ground uh, it's in the air so I'll copy paste that again make this a lot smaller so we'll make it like 95 105 uh, it's going to hit the ground, so it's got to squash again, so we'll call it 105, 95. And then a couple of frames later, it'll come to rest at 100 and 100. All right, so if we play this back without adjusting the easing of our squash and stretch, it's already starting to look a lot more interesting. Um, but obviously, as animators, it's up to us to jump into the graph editor and always make sure that everything is perfect. All right, so we know for a fact, if I take a look at my graph editor for position, if I unlock this quickly, um, when I take a look, most of my action takes place at the beginning of that interpolation. So I can mimic that in my scale. So I'll just drag these points out here, obviously making sure not to drag that point off the line. All right, so I'll keep it like so. Uh, so that's nice and timed. Then taking a look at this, um, what we want is maybe for that to sort of ease into position. So it sort of like squashes itself down. Um, it sort of holds itself and then it jumps into the air and uh, we'll kind of throw the mountains in this direction. All right. Um, so the reason why I'm throwing in that direction, typically in the graph editor, you guys will start finding that when you create peaks like this, it then often works to have the next peak right sort of like next to it, all right? So that you're easing fast, easing out again. Uh, it's just a general rule of thumb, it's not gonna work with everything, but it is something that um, will work uh, sort of most of the time. All right, so then that happens. Um, let's drag our graph editor in this direction. Um, so that it eases into, huh, okay, maybe not. Maybe we just leave it as is, yeah. Okay, we can leave that one as is. Um, so it jumps, boing, perfect circle, down again. Okay, so we want to then obviously adjust this one so that it only starts stretching much later uh, because um, the, the sort of force hasn't really acted upon it yet. All right, so we need that to happen uh, later on as it starts building momentum. So I can take a look at that. That looks a lot better. Uh, and then because I've sort of pushed my peaks in the opposite direction, I might as well push my peaks in this direction. All right, so you see that there's a bit of a pattern and typically it occurs in twos. All right, so I sort of obviously started off mimicking the speed of my pullback. I've got the actual jump um, and then I've got the peak for that stretch into a perfect circle and then easing out of that back into my stretch. Uh, and then when I hit the ground here, we only want that to really happen at the very end of the animation. All right, so we only have it hit the ground and sort of react accordingly. Uh, and then because we've made those peaks, I know from practice that we can push these in this direction. Uh, it's hit the ground quite quickly, so it's going to bounce and leave the ground equally quickly. Boom. Uh, and then these ones here, we can take a look. It might work just to leave them. No. Okay. Uh, normally, I would say we could leave them, but the reason that I'm not going to leave them here is because we don't want that ball to start squashing in midair. All right, it's not uh, it's not believable. Cool. Uh, so we'll hit the ground there, and then we'll basically just mimic what we've been doing so far. Boom. Uh, and then might as well just follow through. Uh -huh. No pun intended. Um, sorry, I'm very tired. You guys wear me out. I love you guys, but you wear me out. All right. Uh, and then when we're um, <coughs> excuse me, when we're done with that play it back and we should have a good um, nice lovely bounce cool alrighty uh, so now it's obviously time to do the tail right so I can lock both of these uh, I'm going to create a layer new solid alright I'll make it the color of my ball 
like so. We'll say OK. And it fills up the entire screen. All right. So the reason now why bend it doesn't break is because if we use smaller layers, such as a shape layer, for example, uh, the bounding box will surround just the shape. And then as soon as the shape passes beyond that box, it will disappear. So because we are creating a solid and then using our pen tool to create a mask, right? We're effectively saying that this shape exists, but it's bounding boxes all the way out here. All right, which then means that we don't have to worry uh, about um, it breaking. Okay, so your tail can look like whatever you want it to look like. Uh, I'll sort of just have it like that. I will grab my anchor point and just move it because it's always good to be consistent about these things. Uh, this tail is a little big, so we can uh, scale it down and we'll bring it, come on. Don't break on me now. There we go. Okay. All right. Uh, so there we go. And we'll call this tail because we label everything. All right. Uh, and let's drop this underneath the controller and we'll parent it to the controller as well. We can even drop it under the ball just so that we've got like this hierarchy slate. And I'll change the color uh, to something other than red so that I don't confuse it with my controller. Okay, so I've got my tail, I've parented it to my controller. So if I play it back, my tail will, will carry on with it. All right. And the next thing I can do is look for effects and presets in uh, the tabs on the right here. All right, if you can't find it, window, effects and presets, right, otherwise control or command five. And we're going to search for bend it. All right, CC bend it. We'll grab that and we'll drop it on our tail. All right, and you'll probably notice that your tail kind of disappears a little bit. The reason for that is here are your start and end points for this effect, all right? So we have to tell After Effects where this actually takes place. All right, so if we take a look in our effects control here on the left, uh, CC Bend it, we've got the actual bend, and then we've got Start and End. Okay, so for the start, we've got this little crosshair. We can click on that, and you'll see that I get this crosshair that then follows my cursor around. And I'm going to click on where this actually begins. All right, so where does that tail attach to the body? The end, obviously self-explanatory, that would be the tip of the tail. All right, so now we've said uh, between these two points affect when we use our bend. All right, and you'll notice that if I pull it too far, it starts to disappear. And you'll notice that that disappearance occurs in line with the start point. All right, so you just can't pull this object beyond your start point, but we can push it all the way up to there. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we are going to create a, uh, a keyframe for our bend. Okay, so that'll be on the tail. And then rather than going through the drop down effect, CC bend it, there it is. We're going to hit U for uniform, and that will bring up our key there. And I'm going to apply easing straight away so that I don't accidentally mistake um, like the lack of easing as an error and then create too many keyframes. All right, we are lazy. We want to work with as few keyframes as possible because it makes it easier to adjust later. Okay, so we now need to then uh, have our tail react to this anticipation. So our character pulls back. Great. We can then bend our tail upwards to reflect that. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm sick. Uh, so we've got that going on. We'll jump back into the graph editor and adjust that later. Uh, for now, as we know, we can copy paste that keyframe. We'll cycle back across, uh, excuse the cat in the background, um, cycle back across just to make sure there's no unwanted movement there. And then this can actually sit here because now we're actually in the midst of our jump. All right, so this, uh, this jump is, we're, we're simulating follow through, right? So maybe about here, I could use that scale as a guide. Um, I will then change my bend in this direction. All right, and this is going to help sell the idea that our tail is sort of like springboarding our character into midair. Uh, and then as our character starts moving past the apex of its jump, it's going to start dragging that tail behind it. Um, so we can actually sort of put that over here maybe. 
um, or we leave that where it is and then as it starts to fall faster we add another key to help sell the idea that that tail is really dragging behind in the slipstream okay uh, it's getting there it's getting there our character hits the ground so two or three frames later we'll have our tail swish downwards all right uh, it gets into mid-air two or three frames after it starts to fall we'll put it back up into the air like so uh, hopefully this makes sense right so we, we aren't aligning our keyframes with the position and scale we're having it overlap by having it take place a couple of frames after the main action all right uh, so our ball hits the ground there and starts moving upwards so we can flip our tail down again and for every flip the the difference is going to get smaller and smaller Okay. At the very end, we'll overshoot the rest, and then we'll come to a perfect stop. Right. So it's the same thing as adding that um, that little squash at the very end of the jump with the squash and stretch, so that our character doesn't look dead. Okay. So we've got some decent movement. Now what we need to do is then just jump into the graph editor and make it perfect. All right. So again, uh, using the graph editor of my position as a guide, we've got a peak right at the beginning. So we can do the same with this. Get a nice peak. There it reacts. Um, okay. And then as it jumps over here, let's see what would be best. If we drag it in this direction, it means that we're going to ease into it and then snap. Nope, that's not working. Let's push it in this direction. And that sells the idea that we're in midair. All right. This middle section over here, because our character is kind of moving um, through the air, right? We're not sort of using the tail to swish us through water or anything. Um, we can actually just leave that easing to control itself, right? Because um, it, it's not a driving force. It's sort of just reacting to the movement. At the very end here, again, it is working, but we can always add, let's see if we can add like a little something, something. Uh, to spice it up. Cool, so we want our swish to happen there at the end. So we can push that mountain like so. Uh, and then it starts moving upwards. So I wonder if we sort of mimic the mountains like that. Yep. So notice a pattern that's forming here as well. And I pointed this out to some of you guys in class today. Typically, when uh, we are animating in the graph editor, if we follow the spline, so if we sort of continue the line, you'll see it sort of forms like an ECG heartbeat kind of thing. This continuation of the line directly translates into the animation. And you'll see that we've got then some nice movement going on there. All right, if I was doing it in the opposite direction, it would be very janky, which is completely viable for um, something that we want to do, uh, if, if that was the goal. But for now, I think this is looking pretty good. All right, so the next thing that I can do, the one thing that I don't like is when my tail swishes, uh, it clips out of the, the screen there. And then obviously there are times when my tail doesn't touch the body anymore because of the squash and stretch. So the next thing I can do is grab my tail layer, shift P for position, grab the keyframe and we don't really need to worry about adding easing to this this is just um, corrective movements they're not movements that are going to positively or negatively affect our animation all right so I'll copy paste that keyframe there and then as our ball jumps into midair basically I can use the scale keys just to see when my ball could possibly not be touching the tail anymore <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, bring that in just a little bit over there. And then um, for that final section, I think it's actually looking pretty good. Uh, so I want to fix the fact that my tail clips out over there. All right, and then again, this is where null objects become so powerful. So if I just go layer new null object, what I can do is I can actually parent my initial controller to that null. And that will just allow me to shift my character up slightly without affecting any of my keyframes. All right, there we go. I'll shift it back just a little bit. And once I'm happy with it, I can delete that null, right? Uh, it has served its purpose and I no longer require its, uh, its presence in my life. 
All right, so there we go. Um, so that is our ball and tail exercise. Um, I hope that this made sense to you guys. Please use this as a guide for when you study for your test as well as when you um, work on your submission. Uh, the very next video that I'm going to record after this is editing with sound. And then I think you'll be well equipped for pretty much everything that you need to do. So I will catch you guys in the next one. Peace.